Well, good morning, everyone. Um, hope you guys uh, will enjoy this message. Um, I, I know we didn't get to have worship this morning, so hopefully you guys do that on your own, um, and I highly recommend it. Um, I know for myself, anytime I'm in stress, anytime I'm in need, um, I put on some worship songs, and I sing along, and my stress, my concerns go way down. I trust you in this time, you are stressed, you, you, you are concerned about what's going on. Try that. I, I, I implore you to try it. Um, so I really felt that God put it on my heart to do this live message today, um, partly just to stand up and say this, this is not going to stop us, um, being that we, we had COVID, we, we couldn't meet inside the church. We, we met outside the church, and then now we've got the fire. The fire says, all right, we're going to force you all out of your homes. We're going to make you guys go to places that you, you don't want to go. Is that such a bad thing? Um, when I say God prepared me, he had me help Samantha with the live stream. I've been working with her to be able to get the, the live stream going. And I'm going, I've got the ability to be able to do this live stream. Well, who's going to do the message? We've got to get a message out of Hope City, all of you, to show you that we are not going to let this stop us. Now, one thing that has come to mind for myself is that everyone kind of sees the fire as a man-made disaster. Um, I personally see it as another attack on togetherness, being together. And I know that that is going to completely backfire. And I say it's an attack because COVID drove us into our homes tried to keep us out of the church, unable to meet with each other and encourage each other. And now we have the fire that's further driven us away from friends, neighbors, family, trying to separate us all out. Instead, for myself, I've become more connected. I have reached out to people up here because I am still here. As you can tell in the background, I am still at my home. And it's super smoky today. After I'm done, I'm immediately putting my mask back on and going back inside the house. But people I've connected with, I would have never connected with before. And I think that is really what God wanted out of this situation. Um, I know that a lot of you uh, that go to the church that are watching probably right now are going to watch this message later. You lost your home. And, and I really am sincerely, you know, hurt by that. And anything I could do to help, I'm more than willing to. Right now, I'm stuck at home. I can't do anything. So I initially was like, well, I'm home. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to keep my place safe. But then I went, wait a minute. Who am I to just keep my place safe? Other people have left up here. W what can I do? Well, I started reaching out to my neighbors and saying, hey, it, it, did you leave? You left? Okay, well, where's your place at? Did you leave anything behind? Can I help from my house? And then I realized what I'm doing right now, why don't I do that for my neighbors? So I started doing a, a broadcast um, in the morning and in the evening for my neighbors, showing them what it's like up here reassuring them that what I've seen as far as you know law enforcement helping out and the fire crews that to reassure them that it's gonna be okay those of us who are in Burrow Valley yes we did not get burned out I, I know that there are others that, that did now I'm gonna give you a little bit of personal background about myself I actually have a very close relationship to losing a home back in 2015 there was a Butte fire if you remember anything about it, it was in uh, Northern California area near Jackson. As you can hear, I'm outside, so you're going to hear some of the, the animals around. In that Butte fire in 2015, I remember it really well. And God really tested my wife and I in that year. And the reason why I say he tested us in that year, we actually were also going to have our first child. Okay, our first child was going to be due sometime probably around in November. So pregnancy's progressing along fine. Wife goes in to get a checkup. Next thing I know, I'm getting a message from her saying, 
I'm getting admitted to the hospital. I potentially am going to be having the baby tonight. This, mind you, is 24 weeks into a pregnancy. This is not a good sign. We were completely terrified at that moment. We ended up having doctors tell us that potentially your child has about a 50% survival rate right now if it's born today. You know, I prefer to have upfront honesty, but boy, did that sure hit home hard. We ended up being transferred from Clovis Community over to uh, Fresno Community. They have a better NICU for taking care of premature babies. Uh, we ended up spending, I'm looking down at my computer for notes, um, about two weeks there. And then our, our daughter was born, and some of you do know her. Her name's Briella. She was born at 25 weeks, six days. And she only weighed two pounds, two ounces. So now that has happened in the very first part of September. So, okay, so that's happened. Butte fire comes on right about the first week of September. So right after we have our child. So we're dealing with that. We have family that live up there where that butte fire is going on. Next thing we know, they have to leave their home. Now, the way they left their home was not like some of us here. They actually got a phone call. I start there. They did not get a phone call. They were at home sleeping. And the next thing they know, they got the neighbor at the door going, why aren't you leaving? The fire is here. They only had time to grab the stuff that was on them and their two horses. And if I remember right, one of their dogs, that was it. And they left. So they hightail it out of there, leaving behind their home. And they were in a situation like a lot of you are. Is my home standing? I don't know. Let me get up on the computer. Look up fire maps. I'm on helping them too. We're still dealing with their daughter in the hospital. We've got them up there. And they're getting displaced. The fire turns and heads to the hotel that they're staying at. They get evacuated from that hotel. And we feel the lead to go, you know what? Just come to our house. We've got a room. We'll, we'll put you up here. It's going to be safe here. There's no fire in this area. So they come down. They move in. I have now increased my home by two more adults and a young child. So now I've got three more residents that I'm having to learn to live with, which anybody, whoever moves into your house, it's, it's an adjustment period. Plus you have the stress of not knowing if a home's available that's theirs. My wife grew up in that home, so she's emotional because we don't know. Well, in the end, the home was a complete loss. I ended up going up with my wife um, while Cal Fire still had it closed. They let us in to get some animals that were still there. Yeah, we actually had uh, turkeys in a pen there that survived the fire when the house burned down. And we're talking only maybe 50 feet away from the house. So, miracle birds. Uh, miracles continued all the rest of their animals um, except for their chickens but their dogs their cats all were later found or they were brought in by people so pretty much everything animal wise survived um, which was a miraculous thing so I bring all of this up to say in that time period that was going on and then it even got worse <laughs> Because once we were ready to go home with our child, my work says, oh, hey, by the way, we are going to have a special deal on you that we need to have start have special meetings with you because you're not performing to the standard that we want you to. Talk about, you know, nail in the coffin, finish me off. I can't, I know, I'm done. So, you know, gut reaction is I'm mad, I'm furious about it. In the end, though, what it brought home to me from this is what was I most concerned about? Was I concerned about worldly possessions, a worldly job, or was I concerned with what I needed to be concerned with was my relationship with God, my relationship with others. And I know at moments it was really hard, but then at moments I had that time where you're like, you know what? God's testing me for a reason. I need to be prepared for something. And I told my wife that a couple times. I'm like, you know we're going through this, 
And I bet it to prepare us for something. I don't know what it is, but God wants to go, you know what? I'm going I'm to give you something a little bit harder. I'm going to push you a little bit harder and see and show you that you can handle it. And I'm like, all right, all right, well, I'll, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes to be pushed and stressed and stretched or, as they say, refined by fire, uh, literally. And then we have this happen this year. Guess what? It is almost five years to the day that the Butte fire hit my family members up north and we had to help them out. Now, there's, they finally got a new home. They moved back up to where they were. Not exactly the same location, but they rebuilt their lives. Now, I look at that and I go, yes, it, it was hard. It, it still is. But what are, who are we turning to? What are we researching? What are we doing? So I asked a question of myself recently, and I have to be say I was guilty. And I couldn't answer no. What am I spending the most time doing right now? I am spending the most time in the wrong place. And you know what place that is? It's researching the fire, going, where is it at? Is it coming my way? Is it going to hit my home? You know, oh, is that my friend's house that maybe got burned down? Why am I doing that? It's because I care. But again, why am I doing that? I am doing that because I care about worldly possessions. I know that may be hard for some of you to hear right now because you lost a lot. But think about it. I got the idea in my head after what happened up at the Butte fire that God may be releasing you of your worldly possessions. And again, I know that's hard to hear. But think about it. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, man, I want to go on a mission trip. I want to go help these people. But I don't want to leave my home. I don't want to leave my animals. I don't want to leave my friends. Well, guess what? I know this is hard. And trust me, I understand that. You're released. God has let you go. He's like, you know what? You'd, I've eliminated all that problem for you right now. And, and I know that I saw someone post that a very similar idea on Facebook. Going, I'm, I'm waiting to hear from God. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And I personally also try to keep that in my mind on my day-to-day -day life, including with the business that my wife and I run that's up here. Part of the reason why I stayed. If God takes that away, and I, I, mench I, you know, I talk to God and I actually just talk. I don't go, oh, I got to go to a special place. I just talk to him like he's standing next to me. Or like he's in my mind, I can do, you know, talk in my mind to him. And I say, hey, you know what? If you take away the stuff that I have, just show me where I need to go instead. Don't take it away and then leave me hanging. And I know he won't. But I'm, you know, I'm having a conversation like he's my friend. And I go, do you want me to lose everything? Okay. Well, then what are we going to do? You know, I, I, I want to be excited about that. You know, it's, it's weird. Because the world says, no, you lose all your possessions, you're nobody. I was talking to some people up here about that. And they go, why are these people coming in looting and taking advantage of, of us up here that maybe can't be here to protect our stuff? I go, well, a looter, I, I'm not going to say it's for certain, but they're probably not a Christian and they don't have a good belief and a strong understanding that they'll be taken care of. So if they're going to die with nothing, then, you know, up here, because they're here and they want stuff, why not die with stuff? Because they think stuff makes them valuable, gives them honor in what they do. For me, it's I, I'm trying to continue to focus on this that, no, stuff of the world does not bring me honor. It does not make me more valuable. The world says it does, but it doesn't. God says you are valuable. You, the person, are valuable. And for an example on that, I'm sure you guys know about him, the guy named Job in the Bible. We're going to talk about him for a little bit. So Job, I bring him up because a lot of Christians go the other way. And when I say the other way, they go, well, bad things happen to bad people. Not to Job. He was perfect, an upstanding person. God said so. I mean, if anybody's going to defend you on how good you are, I kind of go to God and say, yeah, he's... He's the, the core man. If he knows anything, he knows it all. So if he says you're good, then you are good. Okay? So with that, he's a good guy, perfect guy. 
and he has bad stuff happen to him. And I'm grateful that, that he is in the Bible. Because what it says is that God may test you, and he wants to know your heart. And when I say he wants to know your heart, he wants to know where you're planted. Where are your roots? And I'm bringing that up to come back to the, what are you doing right now? Do you Are you watching this message and you got another screen up on your computer or another digital device going, what's the fire doing? Is it in, is it in my neighborhood right now? Did my house burn down? I, I don't mind. I don't mind that you do that, but do not make it the focus. And I can say I'm absolutely guilty of it. I, I have made it my focus sometimes. And it's been a lot. Getting ready for this message, it comes back up to me. I'm like, and slaps me in the face and goes, what are you doing? What are you looking at? Who are you concerned about? Why are you concerned about it? If you really truly trust in me, then you don't need to worry. You know, and, and one of the verses that I live off of is through, um, through Christ, uh, let's see, how's it go? Uh, God uh, strengthens me in all things, okay? And through Christ, I'm being strengthened, okay? And I hold on to that. I can do, oh, that's it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm going off memory on this, you know, and so I can show you, I'm not perfect, I don't, I don't have these memorized, and I don't have it perfect, and I don't think we all need to have it that way. We just need to have a heart that says, I'm trying. I am trying. God knows your heart. The world looks at the outside and goes, oh, like what I just did. You screwed up. You're not a good Christian. You don't know your Bible. It's in my heart, though. I, I desire it. I want it. And I'm going to try. And I did. I tried. And I tried. And I tried until I finally remembered it. And I lean on that one. Through Christ, all... Eh, <laughs> I did it again. If he can strengthen me in everything to do anything, then what am I worried about? I mean, when we, we, we saw the fire come to what we thought was the ridge of Burrow Valley, when it was coming up, what we thought was on the ridge, we started grabbing stuff. And in my mind, I'm thinking about that verse. I'm also trying to remind myself if I leave stuff behind, it can be replaced. Some of it, I know people will say, cannot be replaced. There are keepsakes. But in reality, why do we have keepsakes? They're to keep a memory alive. Can your memory be taken? No. Your memories are your memories. Yes, you might miss the image that was taken with the camera. Or you might miss that special item that was given to you on a special date. But your memory is still there. And that's awesome. Where's that a gift from? That's a gift from God. Your memory is a gift from him. If you can keep that memory, then you're, you're perfect. You don't have to worry about keeping that item. The item is just to help you remember it, but it's still there in your memory. And guess what? If you're still alive today and all your stuff's gone, you know what you get to do? You get to create more memories. You do. Just think about it. I know we've, I know, I know, I understand. I, I can see some of you right now going, but I, you lost everything and I, you know, I'm just, I'm distraught. I'm grieving right now. I understand that and I get that. But I'm trying to encourage you and say, you look, just, just think about it. You're going to get to tell family members and others that I went through this horrific thing and I'm still alive and I can, I can do other stuff. I can still go places. I mean, some of you might say, well, I have no money. I can't do anything. Who gave you money? Oh, I worked for it. I got a job. I got employed and I got this career. Who gave that to you? God did. God gave you those opportunities. And if God's going to give you those opportunities to do things, why wouldn't he do it again? Why wouldn't he even maybe even give you better things? Uh, what about that guy, Job? What happened with him? Everything got taken. We're just going to go through some of the items just as a review. I know some of you guys know this. But, okay, so when when it was in heaven, Satan got in, uh, in front of God and said, you know what, you know, I'm just wandering around looking for somebody basically to pick on. And God says, well, I got this holy and upstanding guy, you know. He's, he's fine. And just Satan's like, huh, yeah, watch this. I can take stuff away from him, and he's going to turn over and turn against you. And God goes, no, no. And I know in the, the reading it now, again, what I bring up, God knew his heart. He knew in his heart he would not turn. Now, it was still Job's choice. 
And I could do a sermon on free will too later if you want to. We can get into that. But so what ended up happening here is, and now I'm going to go down to, to my, my Bible verses here for Job. Specifically, I'm looking at verses 13 through 22. So now I'm actually going to read it specifically. And it says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys, feeding beside them when Sabaeans, again, I'm not a Bible scholar here. I'm, I'm just like a layman, guys, raided us. They stole all of your animals and killed all your farmhands. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Continues on. Well, I, he was speaking. So that, that servant was speaking. Another person walks up, another messenger, and says, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all your shepherds. I'm the only one escaped to tell you. And guess what? Another guy shows up while that guy's speaking and says, Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stole your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Isn't that bad enough? No, oh, here comes another guy. Um, yeah, hey, by the way, your sons and your daughters were feasting in your oldest brother's home, and a powerful wind from the wilderness hit all sides of the house. And they are all dead. And I'm the only one who escaped to come tell you. Now, I, I fully understand here Then what he did. He tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head, which, if you know anything about biblical stuff, they did not shave their heads. They did not cut their hair. That is extreme uh, to do that kind of thing. But then what did he do? He fell to the ground to worship. And I go, is that what any of us did? And again, I'm not calling you out to try and put you down and say you're a screw up. And that is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that we are all turning from any deviation that we've been doing back to where we need to be focused. Did any of us worship God? Like I said at the beginning, did any, were any of you like, oh man, this fire's coming close. I'm not turning on my computer or my digital device to look at a map, but instead I'm turning on worship music. I mean, think about it. There, there's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They got thrown into a furnace, and they didn't burn. Are we, I mean, I know it's a push, but are we willing to sit in our homes and worship God as the firestorm comes? I mean, think about it. If, if that were to happen, now I know, I'm, I'm just go with me on this. If that were to happen and the firestorm came through and God goes, you know what? I tested you. And you are doing what you're supposed to do. You are worshiping me, and you are turning your heart to me. And you're genuine in what you're doing. I'm going to wipe the fire right over your home. Wrap my angels right around it, and it's going to go right up and over. Talk about a news story. If every one of us were doing that, and God did do that, and every news aid caster came up to all of us and said, Hey, why did your house not burn down? Well, in the moment, I was worshiping God, and I, was, I felt filled with the Holy Ghost. Talk about a witnessing tool. That would be awesome. Now, I know, you know maybe some of you guys did do that, and I, I applaud you. And I think God would be like, you know, going right on, you know. And some of you left, went down, and that's fine, too. You did what was in your heart to do. So again, I'm not calling anybody out to say you're, you're, you're wrong in what you did, but I'm trying to get you to think differently. And I really think that's what's on my heart, and that's why I'm doing this. Again, think differently. I didn't back down when it was like, well, hey, well, the church is closed down now. There's potentially going to be no power. I was prepared this morning before last night when the power came on. I'm doing this with my generator. I don't care. We are going to get a message out to all of you to say, God's not stopping. The message is going to get out. 
okay? So just re recap on the stuff he lost. Okay, so he lost, one of the, the first items was his oxen and his donkeys were stolen. What I view those as, those were tools for work. You know, that was the tractors, that was the vans of that era to move things around and transport, okay? So he loses a bunch of tools. So those of you who have lost tools in this fire, there's one number one. Next thing he lost that he lists here, um, I got listed, is his sheep were burned up. And I believe that was also his crops and, and they were listed in that one. So there's all of your produce, your food supply, um, your sacrifices are all gone. So all your refrigerators that are spoiled, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, all that meat and whatnot that's gone, there it is. He, he had that taken from him too. Uh, the next item listed is camels. Uh, what I see camels as from that era that's all the transportation vehicles, all your cars, your motorcycles, your UTVs, your anything that you use to get around with, right there. Buses, whatever. So all of his cars are gone. Now the next item is, I think, the one that he could really hit home with me with what I was going through in 2015. All of your children are gone. He lost his children. Now, I haven't checked, but I don't believe there's been loss of life or if there has been loss of life from this fire it's been very very minimized um, there's been some people I believe that have been hurt but not not loss of life I could be wrong I did not check that source so I'm not going to say that for certain but I don't think any of us potentially I can say didn't lose a single child okay he lost children I'm trying to show you that what we have going through is bad what he went through was even worse and it's not because he was sinful. It was to show us that God knows your heart. And whatever you've done, God knows your heart. So, again, I'm, I'm trying to, to encourage you that it's what's in your heart that matters. I know for myself, when I, I'm up here in my home, I wanted to help others. But I was fearful initially because I'm like, man, I'm in a mandatory evacuation zone. Um, police departments come and talk to me and I talked with them and I said, I'm, I'm politely refusing to leave. I was nice about it and they go, yeah, that's that's fine. There's there's no imminent threat. And I am connected on the network looking for where the imminent threat was, where it could be coming from. So I'm prepared. Now, think about that. What I was doing was preparing myself for the attack. Are you preparing your heart for the attack Satan is going to try to do on you? If you're prepared, it's not a problem. I was prepared. I loaded my stuff up on my vehicle. I got all my animals ready to go. I was ready. I was prepared. Now, God didn't push me to that past the envelope, at least not yet, to say, you know what? Let's see how far you are prepared. Are you ready to go? Did you get everything you think you needed? So prepare your heart for days when you're going to be detested. Some of you are going to be displaced for a while. And I know how that was. I had my mother-in-law visit, you know, staying with us for quite a while. With that, what should we do like myself? that are safe, that did not lose anything. Well, let's continue with what happened with Job. Job 2.11, what happened? Job has three friends. Is that coincidence? Their, their names, they, they have names, but what if we said that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Three. I don't know if God was, you know, purposefully trying to show us again a three, you know, three that are there to help. Now, I know, I know, I know the part of this rest of the story about what they do and what they say, but I'm just saying three came. Why? Why is that important? Well, 
that's what it is. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are all three important. So I see that as, a, as an important item to, to notice. Another part of that, what did, they, what did they really come to do first? What did they do? What was the very first thing they did? They came to him. They, they, they traveled. It says they traveled to him from their homes. And what did they do? They comforted him and consoled him. And then it says that he was grieving. He, Job, was grieving. I mean, obviously, you could see that he was grieving. And they joined in with that grief. They didn't come in and say, well, if you would have cleared 100 feet from your house, it wouldn't have burned down. And if you would have used the right construction material in that uh, shed that the party was going on in, it wouldn't have blown over. And if you would have hired the right security forces for your animals, they wouldn't have gotten stolen. No. I know that the world will tell us some of that and say, you know, these are the reasons and this is the way you could have been safe. Uh, no, they, they came in and they came next to him. Part of it also says that they did is they sat on the ground, which is normal for that culture and that time period, for seven days and nights. Is there something else that happened in seven days? Think creation. So could we say that Job was recreated because he had to wait seven days and seven nights? And by the way, I'm going to tell you that right now. I did not see that as I was writing this last night. That came to me right here, right now. So, and then what did they do? They didn't say a word to him. So that is to show you that, you know, you've got a friend that lost their home. And you're watching this right now go, man, I want to help him out. I, I don't know what to say. That's normal. <laughs> I mean, it says it right here in the Bible. All they did was come on, come over to his house, sit down next to him, cry with him. Didn't say anything because the grief was too strong to even know what to say. So sometimes not saying anything is saying something. You know, we do the whole moment of silence. And I think that's a reset for a lot of us. At least I see it that way for myself. When they go, okay, at this such and such event, we're going to do a moment of silence for whatever. It, it sets everyone to the same starting point. You're thinking about everything that's happened that's related to whatever you're doing the moment of silence for. And we all start again. So think about it as a race. We all li are lining up on the start line while the silence is being done. And then as soon as that silence is broken, here we all go. And we're all marching as a team, or we're all off racing together. Okay? So just keep that in mind. As you have friends, neighbors that, that lost everything, just be there to listen to them. Let them cry. Let them tell you everything that they've lost. And just agree with them. Yes, I, that's hard. I'm sorry you lost that. You know, and you can ask, what can I do to help you? And if they say nothing, don't take offense to that. Just go, I'm all right. But, you know, here's my contact info. Let me know if I can help you or if I can connect you with anyone. And, you know, God will lead your heart if you let him to know if you need to follow up hourly, daily, monthly. You know, think about that. Let God lead you in your heart how often you should reach out to that person. But reach out. Let them know you're there. So again, I really want you to, to think about this from your heart. What should you be doing? Keep your eyes open for people you need to help. What you need to do. Um, I'm reading down on my notes here, making sure I'm, I'm getting everything said that I felt that I needed to say. Um, again, I was reaching out in my neighborhood to connect with people. Um, I'll bring up one very important one. I actually went over to hook up a neighbor's generator to give them power. 
and we actually found a major problem with their electricity coming into their house. Potentially in a short period of time, they could have had a fire in their electrical panel and burned their house down. Um, I felt led, you know, my wife's like, I don't, I, I'm telling her what I want to go do. She's like, I don't know if I want you to go help. You know, that's a risk on you to, to go and install a generator on a neighbor's house. I said, yeah, but I've done it before and I know what I'm doing. I mean, I'm not an electrician, but I know what I'm doing. I listened to my heart. I went and did it. And this is the cool part. I love these kind of stories. And I've got more of them to share. I go over there and I'm hooking up the generator. And I'm having problems. It's the generator's not wanting to supply power to the panel. And I'm checking the cord that I'm running in between. And I'm like, did I, you know, is the wires wrong? I, what am I doing wrong? And I, mind you, I had actually, you know, installed it onto a breaker, put the mains off so that we could feed the whole house and just intermittently use what was needed. And I'm going, what am I doing wrong? I, 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 I don't see this. I'm, you know, I'm missing something. And what ended up, what it was, for me now, looking back at it, it was God going, I'm not letting you power this house. You need to see something. And I'm like, what do I need to see? I, I, you know, now, you know, looking back now, what do I need to see? I need to see that their main breaker feeding the house had been arcing. And that it was actually melting inside the panel. Yeah. And God was like, you know what? Yeah, you're, you're, you're doing it right, Josh. You went over there with that generator. You wanted to hook it up. But you know why you wanted to do that? Is because I was leading your heart. I needed you to go look at that neighbor's electrical panel. I needed you to find this problem. And I kept that generator from working right for you until the problem was fixed. And that's what happened. I found the problem. I went back over to the generator and wired it just to the person's well directly. There's a breaker on the generator. Generator's working. No problem. Found a problem that God needed me to see because I followed my heart to go help this person out. It was a risk because I'm installing it on the, their their house. So, you know, it. you need to follow your heart with what he wants you to do. So, again, I, I look for those, those times and it was like, well, yeah, you just didn't know what you were doing with the generator and how to work it. No, I believe God was there going, Josh, I need you to look at this electrical panel. It's a problem. And I've been trying to get somebody here to look at it, but I can't get anyone to go. And I've got you going. I've got you to go to this neighbor's house. And you're doing what I want you to do. So follow your heart. You might not be comfortable with what he's calling you to do. But trust me, he's working with you. So... You know, let me think here. There's some, there's another piece here I wanted to bring up. With what is going on, I'm going to talk about one thing that's ha happened to a lot of you, and that's your refrigerators. Okay? Why do I want to talk about refrigerators? Well, God put it on my heart as I was writing this up last night. You need to talk about that. You need to talk about the food spoiling. I go, Why? Why would I want to, I want to talk about spoiling food in a message. Yeah, here's why. The spoiling food, the inside of that refrigerator is your heart. You know what? I don't make no sense. Okay. Refrigerator is on, plugged in. The inside of that refrigerator is a good place, right? To me, that's when you are plugged in to a community and a church that cares. They're feeding you good. You're able to keep yourself good. It's a continuous process. Okay? You've got that shell of that refrigerator. That's the outside of you. Okay? Next thing you know, you unplug. Or you get unplugged, like what we had happen up here. You got forcefully unplugged. A lot of you forcefully moved out of your house. 
So now you have to choose, do you plug into something else or go, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a different area. I don't know these people. Uh, I'm not comfortable here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay unplugged. I'm not plugging in here. I don't know this area. Why? Plug in. Trust me. Plug in. And say, you know what? Hey, I, I, I want to I wanna help people. Well, yeah, but you're displaced out of your home. You're living out of an, an RV. So? You go camping in it, don't you? <laughs> um, connect with people. There might be somebody who just needs prayer or needs to, to know that you're another fellow displacement person from the fire. I mean, th- there's myriads of things that God could be doing with this. Um, I, I did a message over at the Melvilles back when the church was closed down. And in that message, I brought out the point. I said, we've been meeting inside of a church. With what God has done at that very moment when they it closed the church, he sent us out to the mission field. And I said that over there. I'm like, guys, look look at this. You're complaining that, oh, the governor's shutting us down and it's going to close the church. Fine. He put you on the mission field now, just like some of you that have lost your homes. He's put you on the mission field. In that moment, I'm, I'm over there and I'm, I'm talking and I go, somebody in the neighborhood might hear me talking, just like right now. I don't know who could be around hearing me talk to you guys on here or who's going to hear this message later. This message, the church was never an online video church. We did audio only. Now we're doing video. You know, we're connecting with more people. With this, I was seeing it as God saying, you know what? You remember that other message? We send the light into the darkness. The world's a dark place right now. Literally up here. I can look right above the camera. I'm looking right at the sun. It's an orange dot. It's a dark place. We are light. We who are Christians, who are strong, get out there. Show them that we will stand. We will work together. We love each other. We love everybody. And that is the light that I think God's trying to send into the darkness. The darkness is like, hey, I'm going I'm to give them a pandemic. And I'm going to destroy your church. I'm going to destroy all the Christians. I'm going to scatter them out. And God goes, okay, go for it. Have you ever seen a bull pine cone? explode all those little pieces of fire go flying out what do they do they start more fires if we look at this from a christian standpoint think about it that way as a christian you're put in a situation and you explode you now have sent out the message to a bunch more people that you may have never talked to because of the situation again like i said up here i've met friends now that i've got all over here in Borough Valley that I've not said I'm a Christian. I've just helped them. I've reassured them. And I believe 100% that is what a Christian needs to be doing. Even if you are not in a good situation. Right now, I should have a mask on. I can watch smoke floating around. Looking down at my computer, it's covered in white dust. But I believe it's more important right now for me to give this message to you to show where I rely on and what is my faith in. If God lets me get sick of this because I'm out here and I get too much smoke in my throat, you know what it says to me? I need to go talk to whoever I'm getting sent to to go see about it. And that's my mindset I try to keep. I don't keep it all the time, but I try to keep that. If I'm getting to go somewhere to do something, think about it that God is actually sending you there. It may not be pleasant, like I said. It may be enjoyable. You know, you might get to go to a, I don't know, some of you guys might like going to a vacation to Hawaii. God let you go there. And there may be somebody that you're going to interact with while you're there, enjoying a vacation. And God's God's going, well, you know what, I'm going to put you there. And I want you to talk to this concierge person at the hotel. And I want you just to to say thank you for something that they do. Because they have only been seeing people come up and complain about everything. 
and just come up and say, hey, yeah, thanks for doing such a great job. Thank you for giving me whatever. You know, gratitude speaks volumes. Uh, th that's what I'm trying to, to really push home here. Don't be afraid to do things that are outside your comfort level. Uh, I, I'm, I'm finding myself looking at that more and more going, the more I do it, the more I rely on God, and the more comfortable it becomes. Uh, I used to never like to tell people that I'm a Christian. I didn't. I was fearful over persecution. And then I realized now, as I've gotten older, I don't have to tell them I'm a Christian. I don't have to go up and go, hey, by the way, I'm a Christian, and I'm a good person, and now that I've said that, you should trust me. No, it's the other way. You need to live it, show it, and then they will ask. You know, and, and the people that I've interacted with up here, I don't know what their religious background is. I even had one that I'm pretty certain is not a Christian. And I went in, 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 a, in a different way to them, and I said, hey, I got something going on right now, personally. I said, I need you to pray for me over it. I go, I don't know if, you're, if you believe in God or what, what you choose, but I would like you to pray over me. And I'm, I'm reaching out, showing that I'm also weak. I need help too. And I think that's also a, a strong element that we need to show here, that we don't, can't stand on our own. It's not us. It's not me. You know, it's not that I'm a firefighter and I'm going to stay at my house and, and I can fight any fire. We need help. We all need help. And the way we get our help from, that's God. So keep that in mind. Ask yourself, am I turning to God first before I'm turning to what I can do? If you can keep that in mind and know that you can trust God in all things, it's going to be easy. Now, when I say easy, not easy as in the world's going to see it as easy. It's going to be easy in your heart because you're going to know that it's the right thing to do. So with that, I'm going to say a quick prayer for all of you. Um, that is one thing we can do anywhere, anytime. I'm going to be verbalizing it so you can you can hear it. You don't have to. You can do it in your heart. You can do it in your mind. You can verbalize it. Be careful verbalizing it because verbalizing it, don't become a Pharisee where you're doing it because you want everybody to hear you and that they'll lift you up. You want to do it so that you can lift others up and encourage others. All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I, you know, I'm just your servant. I want you to know that I'm here and that I want others to know that we are going to get through this. It doesn't matter how, but we know that you are going to have our back. You're infinite. We're finite. That's hard to understand. But when I lean on you, I know you're there to help me. I know that you're going to get me through. It might be not the way I want it, but I know you're going to get me through. If I keep my eyes open and my heart open, you're going to do miracles. Miracles that I couldn't even dream of doing. And I would have never done or even thought of. Because you're so awesome in this time. You know, encourage everyone. Show us who we need to be encouraging to. Know that, that you're, you're infinite and that, you, that nothing can stop you. Thank you for giving us the story of Job, showing that it is not sin that causes us to have problems, showing us sometimes it's just a testing, it's a refining, showing us that you are more powerful, stronger, and that you know our true heart. And I thank you for, for those of us that are, you've been strengthening to know that this is true and continue to strengthen us. And I thank you very much for this. All right, everybody. Stay safe. If you need to know anything about Burrow Valley, hit me up on my Facebook page. Um, I'm more than willing to help out. See you guys back up here soon.